Hi everyone, it's V Spirit again here from the James Beard Foundation, bringing you another webinar in our industry support uh, seminars. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you if this is your first time, um, and thank you also if you've come back and, and seen us a couple times this week. Um, as always, we want to just make this another uh, opportunity for us to take the scary or the unknown out of something. So. We have Ellen here from FRAC, who is an expert in SNAP food recovery programs, the restaurant meal program, and she's gonna be giving you a ton of advice and information as to how you can get involved with these programs, how you qualify, how you apply, how to relay this information to your employees, friends, and family. But it's not meant to be in lieu of um, like discovering you know, what's legal and what's happening in your own state. It's really meant to be a broad um, sort of introduction to the programs, answer some questions if we can, uh, but again, the disclaimer of this being a friendly peer-to-peer -peer conversation and not in lieu of you checking your own state laws um, applies. Uh, there, We want this to be an interactive and exciting uh, webinar for you guys. So Emily's going to tell you a little bit about how you can interact with us during this webinar. Yes, and hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so we will send out a link to that after we close up. Um, we are going to save questions for the end, but we know that things might come up as we go along. So please write your questions in at any time using the question function right on your uh, control panel. If you're having de technical difficulties, you can uh, send me a message either through the questions function or through the chat function, and we'll do our best to help you troubleshoot. Great. Thanks, Emily. Um, um, so, so, Ellen, I'd love to turn it over to you. Uh, tell me a little bit about FRAC. We're getting a little bit of feedback. There it goes. Tell me a little bit about FRAC, about yourself, um, and what we can expect uh, with the SNAP programs. Yeah, no, that's great. So, thank you so much for having me, and we appreciate the fact that uh, the foundation does so much work uh, trying to highlight the need for people to access food and what a wonderful um, job the uh, chefs do and, and all of the industry does in trying to um, help all Americans. So we appreciate this. Uh, I'm gonna be um, proceeding from some slides. So I might yep. start with that and maybe next slide, which, because um, you've asked me about FRAC. So the next one would be what I'd be on. Um, and that is what we sure. do. FRAC is leading national nonprofit organization working to eradicate poverty related hunger and undernutrition in the United States. But we do a lot of research, we do a lot of advocacy, and we provide training, technical assistance. Most importantly, though, it really is the work that we do with state and local-based organizations and um, anti-hunger community out in the community. And, and one of the things I'll emphasize at the end is our ability to connect any of you with that network if you're not already connected. Um, and that's, I think, probably our biggest um, resource and most important contribution we make. So next slide. Uh, federal nutrition programs. So FRAC cares deeply about eradicating the root causes of hunger and poverty. And we know that the food access programs are only one piece of ending hunger and poverty, but those are the programs that we have the expertise in, that we provide leadership on. And so those are the ones I'm gonna go through on this slide in a very broad way. SNAP. Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, used to be called Food Stamps. Mm -hmm. it, it is the broadest of the programs. Currently, there are about 36 million people connected with SNAP, but I'm sure you can tell just from the headlines that many more people, of course, are in need and are gonna be in need of temporary assistance, whether that's through SNAP or unemployment insurance or other things. SNAP is the broadest program. It serves individuals of all ages, People apply through their state and county administration. They get electronic benefit transfer cards, EBT cards. Those get redeemed at regular food retailers. Uh, there are eligibility restrictions in terms of income. Assets do not count against a household in most, most states, but, there, but some of the rules do vary state by state. And so your caution about this being broad brush and um, checking with exactly um, what's going on in your state would be important to know. With respect to um, immigrant eligibility, immigrants uh, are eligible for SNAP if they're documented, um, but mm -hmm. some of them may be um, subject to public charge, and that's a separate issue. Um, 
Uh, I'll just leave that right there. Uh, the one exception to where um, SNAP benefits can be used is an underutilized feature called the Restaurant Meal Program. And we could talk about that more in Q&A. Um, California is one of the only states that has made robust use of it. Um, but Congress has allowed states and USDA allows states, if they choose to allow access at a restaurant and they, the state chooses which restaurants they wanna authorize for this, and the people who are eligible under federal law to redeem their benefits there and purchase meals are people who are 60 years of age or older, are dis disabled, have disability, or are homeless. They don't have to be all three. Yeah. Uh, California makes very robust use of that. There are many, many, many restaurants throughout the state. It's nearly statewide in California. Uh, they've used that program in more recent years to help get meals to hungry college students if they're homeless. And mm -hmm. that's a very big ramp up that's going on there. So I've put two links into this slide to give people an idea if they've never heard of the restaurant meal program, generally what it is and some information about where it's working in California. I think we're seeing renewed interest given the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and on people's access to food. There's renewed interest that we're, we're hearing from people around the country and a lot of national stakeholders who are interested in what could be built during this um, emergency response, what else could be built around that program, given that it's in such a limited area and currently only with limited populations. Uh, the yeah. one um, requirement for the uh, restaurant is that they have to have a low cost meal option on the menu, but that's not that doesn't restrict what the uh, SNAP purchaser could buy. Uh, the other programs I want to mention to you are the school meals and after school and preschool meals, um, school meals and what we call child and adult care food program. Those, of course, provide very important uh, resources um, for children, uh, really of all ages up to 18, to be able to access uh, food, whether they're in preschool or after school and during the school year, also as well through summer food programs. Obviously, in social distancing in this um, environment, many schools have closed. It's, um, and, and those meals that children are missing are a big burden on the household. Um, often, those are, those are really an important way of families handling their budgets, the fact that they don't have to provide those meals out of their own resources. And because of that, uh, I'll go through in a minute some of what um, Congress has done in response to that. But uh, that's a program that's available generally um, for free and reduced price. You're talking about um, you know, relatively low and lower middle class um, families, but uh, it also has uh, wide uh, availability. And like, uh, like WIC, Women, Infants, and Children Program, which is a, a food package that is, a, and, and also breastfeeding advice and other services to pregnant women, postpartum women, um, uh, infants, and, and children up through age five, uh, those programs, School Meals and WIC, do not have citizenship restrictions um, attached to them. They're, so there's very good availability in communities. TFAP, the um, Emergency Food Assistance Program, is an acronym for the commodity distribution that is a lifeline for food banks around the country. And so those, those are the regular programs. The SNAP, School Meals, and CACFP are entitlement programs. What that means is that when need increases, whether that's due to a disaster, whether it's due to an economic downturn, or due to this particular COVID, which is a combination of a disaster and um, an economic disaster as well, uh, those programs can serve more people as long as they fit the qualifications. It's not a matter of Congress having to appropriate more money to accommodate new, new people coming on under the same, the same eligibility criteria. Um, and so the programs respond very well during um, times of stress. And um, that doesn't mean there won't be more that could be done with them and to build around them. But that entitlement structure is a very important feature of the programs that allows them to respond quickly and robustly. So next slide. That's great. Well, I, mean, I want to just stay on this slide for one moment. Um, that's great to hear. 
because I know a lot of the folks who have been joining our webinars are saying, you know, it's taking so long to get these, um, whether it's unemployment or it's the PVP approval or it's any of the other relief programs we've talked about, knowing that even if you or the folks in your community had never qualified for SNAP before, never applied before, or the women, infants, and children, which also is, it's for any caregiver, right? You don't actually have to be a woman to apply as long as you can prove that you have an infant or a child you're caring for, right? I think that's right. I'll double check. Yeah. yeah, I think that they had changed that recently. Um, so we'll we'll double check that, but we want to um, you know make folks aware that these are things that are going to be most available to you and have to the concern of being undocumented. They don't, you know, some of them don't have citizenship requirements, which is also extremely helpful. And where folks were getting that free meal at school, they're now allowing people who are having to feed their children at home to take that money back and it be allocated whether it's ebt or snap or wic so you're those people will be able to take that money that was going to the school and now use it personally so we're going to talk more about that and i think that's going to be really key to this conversation is really getting the ins and outs and exactly how people can access those funds during this time yep and one thing i put down at the bottom of this slide is a link to our website because just for the information about how the programs normally work uh, and examples and things. There is a lot of information, and and so you can dig deep, more much more deeply on all of these programs that are on that slide list. Great. All right. Next slide, Emily. So I think we want to go. Yeah. So that's the next one. Uh, COVID nineteen food response. So the Congress has worked closely with the White House in recent weeks to plus up. A lot of programs recognizing that this is a major crisis and among the among the responses in what we call package number two so this was enacted maybe a couple weeks ago they have given permission to states to add benefit amounts for snap households that already have cards already are, are uh, participating in the program if they are not already getting the maximum allotment for a household of their size SNAP is very tailored to individual need. And so benefits are not a one size fits all. They're tailored to how big your house is, how many people are in it, and how poor you are. Um, so not everybody is, is at the, um, so go, uh, yeah, so not everybody, of course, is at that maximum allotment. And mm -hmm. what states are doing right now and have been doing for the last week is adding a temporary supplement to the uh, March in some cases March, in other cases April, month of benefits, and they will do that for two months. Um, there was no um, restriction in the legislation that it end after two months, but that's so far USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, which administers these programs, has, has not looked beyond how they will operate this uh, past the, those two months. But we would expect, given the severity of the downturn, that there will continue to be extra dollars put onto those SNAP cards for many, many households, not those though already at the maximum amount. Uh, PEBT P stands for Pandemic EBT. And you may remember we talked about EBT cards on the last slide. Uh, PEBT is the way that states are going to be working to get the value of the missed free and reduced price school meals to the households with kids whose schools were closed because of the pandemic. We estimate that'll be about $125 per child per month. Um, currently, the states, through their SNAP offices and through their child nutrition offices, are working together to figure out the best way operationally to get those benefits onto the cards and in the hands of the households. Um, there are some easy pathways, but but there are some difficulties in some states. So. We will be monitoring that and continue to monitor that very closely. We're working um, to get it expedited as quickly as we can get it. Uh, we're also going to be working to see how long, how many uh, months, uh, well, whether or not we'll be able to do this past uh, the end of the school year. But that's important resource. And so quick um, question I, on that, Ellen, we just had come in to clarify. Is this something that folks who are on SNAP or get SNAP, they need to specifically ask for or the raise in either the raise in SNAP allowance or this PEBT? And how do they ask for that? Right. So, no, it should be automatic. The only thing 
The only thing that we're asking for usually comes in the form of advocacy. So in other words, we didn't take for granted on um, the adding the amounts to the, the, the SNAP household benefits. We didn't take for granted that all states would do it or do it quickly enough. And so we worked with them, but it, it did not require individual participants to have to do that. In some cases, participants do advocate and we welcome their advocacy. Um, and, and so it never hurts to ask, but this is not something where somebody has to apply for it. Those benefits just automatically get put on the cards. And most of the notice that someone who has an EBT card gets about, wow, why is this now on my, on my card? What is this a mistake? Is they've been alerting clients mostly through the mass media. Um, okay. And and uh, and so we've been helping get the word around, and I think it's you know it's always good to share that information. But this is not something that they should have to ask for individually. On PEBT, we're working carefully with uh, the administration and administrators around the country to try to minimize any kind of um, uh, uh, action that a household would have to take in order to get that PEBT. It'll be relatively easy for the existing SNAP household to have the PEBT put on the card, uh, but, but we know there are many children outside the SNAP households who also are certified for free and reduced price school meals. And so identifying them and making sure that the card is going to the right place is, is a bit of an administrative undertaking, but we are gonna be working very closely to minimize any kind of extra steps that the individual household would have to take. Well, thank you, Ellen, for taking that step for us and, and Frack for, for advocating for that. Um, we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of partners. We've got a lot of partners. you got a lot of support out there, folks, who are, who are on the webinar and beyond, letting them know there are agencies like Ellen's that are, that are taking, this, taking this up. So thank you. Yeah. And then just the last things I want to point out on this slide is that there have been uh, proposals from the administration to cut back on SNAP, um, a series of rulemakings that were put out last year that we have been opposing. They would have taken billions and billions and billions of dollars out of the food economy um, and really uh, created much greater hardship for people. Uh, the, the one bill that um, this slide refers to has suspended um, one of the rules that they tried to make even um, a tougher rule. And so mm. for adults, some adults, have to prove that they are working sufficient hours every month in order not to have a time limit of three months apply to their SNAP receipt. Three months out of 36 months. Uh, that's a really harsh rule. It, it, it sometimes hits people whether or not they're employed. If they're underemployed and they just can't have stable work hours, it, it, they can't always show that they've got 80 hours um, a month. And certainly in this downturn, suspending that time limit has been so important. So for any of you who hear about time limits and some of those rules that normally interfere with people getting SNAP, right now that's suspended for the, the term of this health crisis. Lastly, are administrative actions. And so a lot of this can sound fairly wonky and bureaucratic, how people get connected with benefits. We want it to be as easy for people um, to connect with these benefits as it can possibly be. We, want, we are working with administrators to try to get um, changes to regular procedures so that it's, it's possible for states who are stressed, uh, they're trying to social distance, they're trying to run their operations remotely. We're all, you know, we're all in a different way of doing business. And so we're looking for those business workarounds that they can get that will will make it more possible for them to deal with what is, I think, going to be a flood of applications for SNAP and uh, perhaps WIC. Um, and so we, we're looking for anything that can accommodate that. We've also been working, and I don't do our child nutrition work, but we've been working on the school meal side to get flexibilities both so that schools could have grab and go breakfasts um, and grab and go lunches, um, and, and, and also that uh, the, the, the relief could be relaxed during the summer for the summer meals program and find ways that food could still be accessed through those funding streams. So it's a, it's a lot of change. Some of it um, will, will mean that on the SNAP side, instead of having to have a, an interview with a caseworker, um, that could be delayed and, and not hold up people getting their SNAP 
uh, right. benefit right away. So those are important. And I've put down on this slide a link to the special web page that we have on the FRAC website, which documents, and, and we try to keep it up to date in real time with all of these various things that are going on. We will be adding, I'm sure, to it um, more in the way of um, information that our flyers and things that, that we're starting to collect flyers and other things that groups are putting out uh, because it's so important to get the word around to the community. But for those who are particularly interested in what actions USDA is approving, uh, what's in the uh, congressional packages that have gone through so far, uh, that's all on that particular page. Great, and we'll be sending this presentation out so you guys will have all of this information as well. Great, thank you. Okay, next. So a point about economic stimulus. We talked a little bit earlier in the in the um, webinar about the fact that we know we're in a crisis when it comes to health. This is this is obviously a huge health um, uh, crisis, but we also know we're in an economic crisis, and um, we know that's hitting a lot of sectors, particularly, unfortunately, the restaurant sector. And so the good news on this is that uh, state that elected officials are starting to pay much, much more attention to what can they do to give the economy a boost. And mm -hmm. I know there'll be many more things that they'll want to do uh, with very hard hit sectors. But one of the ways that they can stimulate the economy that they've done in the past is boosting SNAP benefits further. So when I mentioned that um, the, one of the early packages added some supplemental payments, that isn't the kind of stimulus that was done in 2009 at the beginning of the deep recession. At that time, they not only um, made sure people, you know, had more benefits, but they boosted, they boosted the top benefit. They boosted that maximum allotment, and people are looking at that right now as a way to not only promote food security and public health, but to help with the economic recovery. And that was the biggest reason it was done in 2009 was on the economic stimulus side. Uh, people who are low income are the people who get SNAP. When they get the money in their hands for food, they get it spent. It moves through the economy relatively quickly, um, and it does have a big multiplier effect. Economists mm -hmm. are in general agreement on this particular point I'm going to say next, which is each dollar in SNAP benefits, that's in a federal SNAP benefit, in a downturn, generates between $1.50 and $1.80 in economic activity. That's an enormous wow. weapon, and it's one of the strongest tools that um, policymakers have in the fiscal toolbox. So um, that one I think you'll continue to see more attention on. We know we need the help in the, in the economic sphere. Uh, it can't come soon enough. Um, the sooner the better. Uh, so there's more to be done on that. I would also say that SNAP spending has a positive impact on state sales tax revenues. That's not talked about as much, but when people have money from SNAP to pay for their food in a, in a grocery store, it means that when they're there, they may have some other money that they didn't have to spend out of their regular budget that can be spent on other things, things that frankly SNAP can't pay for, whether that's paper towels or you know a household product or whatever it is, um, and many of those things, unlike SNAP purchases, are subject to state sales tax. We know states are reeling right now and that their revenues are going to take a big hit. And so this is another side to the stimulus impact that um, that's just so important to keep in mind when you're thinking about SNAP. Absolutely. And to all the chef advocates we have on the phone, make sure you make this your like Facebook status after this call that a dollar in SNAP benefits and a downturn generates between $1.50 and $1.80 in economic activity. That's going to be something that's really important as more and more folks are getting into SNAP and you start hearing, you know, political discussions back and forth to be armed with that statistic, um, which just shows that helping folks helps everyone. And so that Showing them the money is oftentimes the best place to move action through quickly, and, and that's something that we want to be armed with is that particular statistic as we continue to advocate for um, boosting funds. So thank you for that, Ellen. Yeah. I think we're ready for the next, Emily. So we know there are many other things that, that people need and that you'd be interested in. We're not experts on the other programs, but I've given you just a flavor of some of the other resources because, of course, unemployment insurance, 
um, direct payments going out to, cons to um, individual Americans, uh, things that have been done through the tax system and, and sick leave and other things that are of interest to employers and employees are all important. I mean, food is a piece of a puzzle. It is not the only thing people need. There's a lot of other things that people need and that can help uh, people through this crisis that can help you, your employees, other people in the community. And so I've just lifted up some of the resources that I think can help you think about uh, what new opportunities are out there with respect to unemployment insurance um, and, and some expansions there that are going to provide better pathways for people to get that. Um, and as I say, a number of measures uh, for employers and of course these direct payments that you know may not be enough but are but are a piece of what what the work has been um, mm -hmm. um, and if you're ready next slide Great. and how can frac help this is really the most important thing we can do help connect you with our lead anti-hunger advocates who are in your state often it may even be in your city or community but these are people who are very versed in these programs. They work with state administrators. They work with policymakers. They work with community organizations that are on the front lines. They're in touch with the client community. Uh, they love to partner with other groups. Some of them may already have partnerships uh, with the restaurant industry, um, and some some may have them with with even people who are who are on this particular webinar. Uh, but they're always looking to make some more of those connections. They are the people who can best tell you who in their state can help any of the people you want to see get connected with the programs. An example I will give you is Maryland Hunger Solutions. That's mm. an affiliate of FRAX. It's, as it sounds, it's a statewide group based in Maryland. Right now, they have turned the application assistance they do for SNAP. They have, they have a project where in normal times, they have people who help participants understand what the SNAP rules are, how to apply, they help them apply, they help them gather the information and figure out how to submit it and prepare them um, for going through the SNAP process. They don't enroll them. These are not government workers, it, but it's an, it's an assist from the outside to connect people with how to navigate these, um, these systems. Right now, because of social distancing, they're doing that work through a call center. I know that they had, I think, 180 calls last week, and those are going up and up and up. And so, but there are application assistance projects around the country. Those are going to be the best places that are going to have the most up to date information with flyers, with, you know, who in the state can they call? Is there a helpline and, and so forth? Um, of course, in addition to that, 211 lines are all over the country. They may not be in every state, but they're in a lot of states. And those um, associated with the United Way, those projects are a great way of getting people referred for services. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're gonna be um, you know, very much inundated. Uh, so that's really the most important thing. Certainly on our website, we have a lot of updates and we'll be updating people not only in changes in programs, but updates on advocacy opportunities. What are the ways to grow some of the programs even the ones that exist now, I gave you the example of restaurant meal program. Our advocates in Illinois and in Maryland last year got their states to uh, pass legislation directing their states to get into the restaurant meal program. So there are ways mm -hmm. to build on to build on things, and some of that takes advocacy. So, um, but but our network right of <laughs> advocates really would be eager to partner with any any of the folks associated with the foundation. Ellen, can you tell me what is 211? I'm I'm not aware. It's a referral line. And um, you just dial 211? I think so, yeah. And it's in many states. And uh, often you, it's associated with the United Way and people okay. call. And they're not always calling for food, but food does tend to be one of the prominent things that people call about. So they okay. might be referring people to, they know who in their state to refer people to for food, for unemployment insurance help. Uh, where you know how somebody would apply for something it's it's a really good resource but we also have helplines uh, a number of our partners have these helplines and um, and any of them it, even if they don't have the helpline would be in a great position to tell someone what is the easiest pathway um, to to go through the process um, and and what's what's the quickest and easiest way to get the information to people fantastic uh, next slide Em. 
Yeah, and then connect with us. You you already gave a you know a social media um, plug already. So um, I just wanted to make sure people know how they can connect with us um, virtually um, and and uh, how how to amplify things that we're doing and and let us uh, look for opportunities to amplify what you're doing on these. And I just given my email address in case um, you know people want to reach out to me directly with uh, questions and information. Uh, but but otherwise, our FRAC website is. Uh, is there for you, and if you have suggestions on things that we should be adding and more we could be doing, we're always open to hearing those. So I um, just appreciate being having the opportunity to be with you today and share a bit about what we're doing. Absolutely, thank you. Um, we've got a couple questions uh, that came in throughout here. So um, the most, we know that the FRAC website now is a place where you guys can go. You can dig into what's happening in your state. You can connect directly with Ellen and she'll connect you with what's happening in your state. We can look at California and say, hey, how can we make this work in our state or our city um, and get the playbooks for that. So we know that that's one resource. A lot of those resources are in English. Is there options for folks who are looking for Spanish or French, German, Chinese guides that they could be handing out to people um, who are also looking for resources? Well, I think we're at the very beginning stages of, of developing that. I will give you as an, an analogy. Um, last year, the federal government shut down and we, we had a need very quickly to get information to people, uh, particularly about whether or not their SNAP benefits were gonna be um, interrupted. And then when the schedule for them was changed radically, fortunately they weren't interrupted, but things changed rapidly. We needed that kind of rapid response and we needed it in a lot of languages. And we were able at that time to be a resource um, for people around the country with um, examples of things in, I think we ended up with 14 languages. Wow. So those were relatively simple um, materials. Uh, I think you know guides will be um, a little more of a challenge, but I would expect that we're gonna start seeing our community develop those. We we did not do that by ourselves at FRAC. We did that with our partners from around the country, who some of whom were better situated to get things translated and to, to share, and then people had templates that they could work from and things like that. So we will very much be looking for those opportunities. And um, you know it'll, it'll be a challenge, I, I have to yeah. say. It does take, um, and especially because with translations, sometimes people um, don't always get the, the terminology and yeah. sometimes the dialect's a little different. And, and so you just have to be very careful that, that you've got the right translation on things. So it, it's, it, it's a bit more involved, but we know we need to do that. And, and I think you'll probably see more coming out from other groups too, not just in the food sector, but some of the other groups will also need to put information um, in other languages. Great, good to know that that's something that folks are thinking about um, and it's something that's ongoing and we can search again for maybe what exists in terms of how to apply for SNAP. That seems like that may be in existence in other languages, but more on what's happening now is, is under development. No one was prepared for this, so good to know that we're at least thinking about it. And then um, can you clarify again just what um, programs are available to only US citizens and which ones are available no matter your status? Okay, so SNAP is the one that, um, that I would lift up that, that it has some restrictions in the food area. Um, yeah. And those, SNAP, even when it was food stamps, was open to legal immigrants, but not anyone who was undocumented. Um, uh, and that's still currently the case. Uh, okay. that it, that most, most non-citizens would be eligible for SNAP. There are some restrictions for adults on whether they've been here in the United States for five years or not. So sometimes there's a bit of a waiting period, but we don't see that as, um, as, a, common, as common a bar. There is a lot of fear in the mm. community about whether or not to access any government programs at this time. So many more people could be getting SNAP even within that immigrant non-citizen category than are applying right now. And mm -hmm. uh, we want to make it possible that they understand all of their rights uh, to be able to access the program. Um, but we certainly understand their caution about right. the environment that they're in. Uh, with yeah. respect to the other programs, with respect to the, the school meals programs and uh, summer food program and WIC, those are open to people who are here um, 
all people. It's not a Doesn't question matter. of whether you U.S. citizen. There's not a citizenship test on that. And, okay. and, and so it's a very important um, resource for everybody. These are programs that, and of course, we believe at FRAC they should be for everybody, everybody who's in need. Everybody who's in need should have access to the programs and um, wish we could say that about SNAP. Is there a place, so with SNAP, that is something you should really only apply for if you have a social security number, United States social security number, a green card, if you have legal working up-to-date papers, like a visa or something, that would be okay, or you have to be a resident, a documented resident? Well, I, I, I would just say a ca caveat on that, and we have information up on the website that I think will be helpful to people to navigate each of those questions. But one one aside I would like to make is that there are many immigrant households that have um, mixed status people in the household. And it's very important to understand that if a parent or someone wants to apply for, on behalf of their US citizen born child, they should go ahead and do that. And they do not have to provide a social security number. And they do not have to give their much of their information because they are not considered part of the household that's applying. It's the it's the it's being done on behalf of that U.S. citizen child. And we know, unfortunately, that given the fear and the confusion about all of these rules, that there are many households that have U.S. citizen children, and yet um, they're not accessing SNAP, as I say, because of the confusion and the fear. Uh, but there are there are good pathways. Uh, for people, and in that circumstance, they wouldn't be giving up their particular social security status. Great. And so we, then folks can find more about that on the FRAC website. I'm sure you could also find more about that on the Share Our Strength website. We'll have Share Our Strength next week coming in to talk a little bit more about these programs. Um, and just reiterating one more time, WIC uh, is doesn't require anything. And the free and school, reduced school lunch, people don't require anything. So those are maybe really, safer. Income, those are income based. Those income are income based. based. Yeah. So it, it and I would say that um, one of the prominent thing that the prominent uh, advances that's been made in school meals in recent years is that schools are using some options available from the federal government, particularly if they're in a high need school where there are a lot of low income children. They're finding ways under the federal rules to make it possible and feasible without it really costing them to serve all children in the school. And so we call that universal school meals where, Excellent. and it's it's an easier way to, to run the program. It's uh, less stigmatizing. Everybody's eating together. Um, it's really, it's a great, great model. And we've been working very hard. My colleagues have, I can't take any credit for that, but my colleagues have been working very hard for years to help school districts understand how to go about doing that. And so um, many of the children who are gonna get these benefits put on the pandemic EBT cards, the ones we talked about before, the value of the school meals will also be part of those, um, part of this as well. And now Ellen, the question that we've gotten most uh, is about how restaurants or small purveyors, cottage goods, just folks who have a kitchen that they can operate from, can be getting contracts to either provide the schools with the meals and the food things or hospitals, fire departments, stuff like that. How can restaurants be accessing those food access programs that are for adults or for children, but that essentially come as like contracts, like feed 250 workers this week, feed 300 kids this week? Well, I think probably out of the programs that we monitor, maybe the best pathway would be the restaurant, the SNAP restaurant meal program. Now that's mm -hmm. not a contract, okay. but we're, we already have 36 million SNAP participants. It's quite likely that this is going to be a much bigger uh, group of uh, consumers that are going to be out there with SNAP cards. Uh, we know that in the County of Los Angeles, comparing the third week in March last year with the third week in March this year, the number of applications doubled. And that's really toward the beginning of this crisis. Um, not only will be people newly needy, you know, just during the health crisis, but as the economic uh, things continue. And so we'd expect the SNAP consumer is probably gonna be a pretty big um, share 
of how food dollars are, are being spent and, and where. And I believe the restaurant meal, we're getting a lot of questions from people about how to expand restaurant meal program, not only to more states, um, but also to expand it at least on a temporary basis beyond the normal population groups. Because, uh, uh, and I would say one of the other reasons we're hearing about that is because people are very concerned about elderly and people who are at home and can't find a way to be able to get the food in their hands. It's, mm -hmm. it, theoretically, it's good for them to have the benefit on an EBT card, but if they can't get out to the grocery store and they can't prepare for themselves. So I think, I think there are gonna be many more opportunities that people are gonna look to the restaurant sector for, given um, the tremendous job that restaurants do in knowing how to prepare food and knowing mm -hmm. how to get it to people. Um, you know, delivery is always an issue in a social distancing situation, uh, but it seems to me that the restaurant sector, whether it's um, having uh, options where people can do grab and go and, and pick up from there. So I think the opportunities within this set of programs, um, but I'll certainly talk more with my, my school food colleagues and see um, whether they think, you know, um, there'll be opportunities. And there could be opportunities down the road. Right now, of course, most schools are closed and there's a limited a limited way that they're doing even the access um, for the grab and go meals where they where they're doing it on the uh, you know an, an alternative basis to what they normally operate. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll just have to keep an eye on that as this moves along. But but people increasingly know that there are going to have to be a lot of different ways for people to get the food in their hands. That um, we're going to have to look to every sector. And I, I do think there are policymakers who are very concerned also about making sure that the restaurants are tapped to play a role in that. Fantastic. Good to hear. Um, something else that we heard this week um, on a few other webinars that I just want to bring up here since we're still talking about food access and contracts. Um, when, when you are advising people or sharing this information about applying for SNAP, they do need to weigh that against if they're getting unemployment benefits because the, the money in unemployment, if you get the maximum, let's say in the state of New York, the 504 plus the 600, could affect your overall income to qualify for SNAP. And that's true, right, Ellen? Like you kind well, of got I will, double, I will double check that. Double check. I know there have been some adjustments in what has been done on the UI side, and I would think that a policymakers. So let me let me hold on that one, and I'll go back. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll follow up on that one, and we'll probably you'll you'll find that in a tweet or in a future webinar. We'll make sure people get the information on that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then going back to a little bit on the how can restaurants win contracts just from another webinar that we had last week that focused on these programs and this is extremely vague so you're going to have to check with your own states but uh, apparently um, with professional fire departments and professional police and so not your auxiliary or your volunteers because of the hours that they're working the state is required to give them a food stipend that food stipend used to go to them going out to a restaurant or something or ordering panera that's not something they can do anymore so what folks last week were doing was literally calling within their city the professional fire departments hospitals and just saying hey i'd like to speak to somebody who's working on your meal delivery programs or on your first responders programs um, and they have somebody within the organization or maybe one of the chief of fire or somebody, it's very vague right now, um, who manages that particular budget is saying, okay, we've got $5 uh, for this shift, we got $10 for this shift, and then you're able to curate a menu and work with them. It is very vague, it is very odd, there's no central resource for it. Um, the only one that we were able to find a central resource for was, feedtheheroesdmv.com, so feedtheheroesdmv.com, that's a Washington DC area program. If you are looking for info on how you can bring that to your state or what may be available, I would say go to their website, see what they're offering, maybe even call them or ask them, you know, hey, tell me about this program, I live in Michigan, like is this something that we could be doing here or how did you guys get this figured out? Um, and we'll have them on a future webinar to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, but it does seem right now like it's very community driven and very cold collie. So um, you might want to investigate feedtheheroesdmv.com, search in your state, call up your local fire department and let them know that you know, you're able to provide uh, low cost meal delivery for them and 
we'll we'll get more info on that. Uh, but it's it's an emerging program that's happening right now. Again, as part of this like emergency disaster relief funding. Um, so that answers all of the. Oh, we got one more. Hold on. Restaurants close help. Yeah, so that's a question about how we can use the kitchens to produce. How do we get the meals ingredients to the right place? That's something that we're still actively working on. So keep an eye out with us and with FRAC and all of our partners on how um, we're going to be turning to the restaurant groups about producing. Um, you can also check out the Lee Initiative. Um, they have a partnership with Makers Mark that was funding some pop-up kitchens to feed hospitality workers. Um, and there's there's just so much happening around it, and it's happening very quickly. It is happening cold call style it's happening like hey fire department i'm your local you love my sandwiches and i'm willing to do this at cost for you or i'm willing to do this at a slight profit for you um so we'll have more info on that ellen thank you so so much for being here demystifying snap giving better clarity to how folks can can get access to some of these relief programs we're going to send out the presentation which has ellen's direct email in it as well as all the links to the ways that you can be applying and passing information along to your um to your communities. As always, you can go to jamesbeard.org slash relief. This is our central resource. We update it two, three, sometimes five or six times a day with what's coming in. Uh, it also has information on our fund. Uh, for those of you who are on the call who did apply to the fund, the people who will be in the first wave of uh, benefactors, pretty sure is getting announced Thursday or Friday. We are not on that team, so I don't have uh, direct info on that, but I did hear that the first checks are ideally going out in the next week or two, so just stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, you can always follow us, of course, at Beard Foundation. If you have an idea for a future webinar, if you need more clarity on this one or on any other program, please reach out to us at impact at jamesbeard.org. Again, Ellen, thank you so, so much for being here. Emily, thank you for running all the tech behind the scenes. We literally could not do these kind of things without Emily Rothkrug and the rest of the team from James Beard who is auditing these calls and taking your concerns seriously and hopefully providing a little respite and a little clearer in the fog to y'all. And uh, we hope to see you again tomorrow at 2 p.m. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.